We are in Omaha, Nebraska for a conversation with Warren Buffett. Like so many people, I got up this morning in New York and read the New York Times editorial page and I found the following column written by him. It is an op-ed which is called Stop Coddling the Super Rich. Here are some excerpts. Our leaders have asked for shared sacrifice, but when they did the asking, they spared me. I checked with my mega rich friends to learn what pain they were expecting. They too were left untouched. While the poor and middle class fight for us in Afghanistan, and while most Americans struggle to make ends meet, we mega rich continue to get our extraordinary tax breaks. Buffett speaks directly to the newly designated 12 member Super Committee of Congress, outlining the stakes for the country. Americans are rapidly losing faith in the ability of Congress to deal with our country's fiscal problems. Only action that is immediate, real, and very substantial will prevent that doubt from morphing into hopelessness. That feeling can create its own reality. He spoke to spending as well as taxes, saying, job one for the 12 is to pare down some future promises that even a rich America can't fulfill. Big money must be saved here. And then he turned to his theme of taxes on the rich. The 12 should then turn to the issue of revenues. I would leave rates for 99.7% of taxpayers unchanged and continue the current two percentage point reduction in the employee contribution to the payroll tax. His argument is specific. For those making more than $1 million, there were 236,883 of them in 2009. I would raise rates immediately on taxable income in excess of $1 million, including, of course, dividends and capital gains. And for those who make $10 million or more, there were 8,274 in 2009, I would suggest an additional increase in rate. So there it is, at a time of great political debate about taxes and spending, one of the richest people in the world looks at his country and says, people like him should pay more taxes. Warren Buffett joins me now to talk about this column, the U.S. economy, the global economy, the deficit and the debt, and what he thinks we should do about taxes. I am pleased to have another conversation with my friend Warren Buffett. Welcome. Good to see you, Charlie. All right, let me, this is not a new idea for no, you. No, it's not a new idea. It's, it, I've done this three times in terms of checking in my office, and every time I come out to be the low taxpayer, but this time I got a little more upset than usual. So <clears throat> you got more upset and decided you wanted to write and, and express what central idea? Well, we've been hearing about shared sacrifice, and believe me, the people out there know what they're talking about on that. I mean, there is sacrifice going on all over uh, this country, and we're talking about people making sacrifices about the promises that have been made to them in the future on, on some entitlements. So I decided to uh, look around and see if any of my friends were being affected by shared sacrifice, and they, like me, are enjoying these extremely low tax rates, and in, in the very high percentage of the cases, the very rich are paying less in the way of taxes than the people to clean their offices between a uh, 10 year period and uh, the rich, the rate they were paying has gone down and more of them have a much larger taxable income. Yeah, well the IRS publishes statistics. They've done that since 1992 about the top 400 earners in the country. It's not the same every year. Those earners have had their income since 1992 quintupled. Now, I don't know very many of our listeners that are gonna have had their sure. earnings quintupled. During that same period, their tax rates have gone down from 29 and a fraction percent overall to 21 and a fraction percent. You are also in favor of spending cuts. We have to, Charlie. I mean, we, we are a very, very, very rich country. We've got close to, what, $48,000 of GDP per capita. If you told me when I was a kid that that would happen, you know, I would have thought you were, you know, you're, yeah. you'd lost your marbles. But we ha even a rich country has limits, and we have promise things that we can't deliver on, and, and uh, that's a mistake, but we're also in the process under taxing the very rich. I don't, what I propose, incidentally, would not touch the taxes of 99.7 percent. I'm talking about three-tenths of one percent of the American public, but the people from a million dollars on up, I think, should be asked to share in a little of the sacrifice that we're all being asked to share. What's in. the formula you're looking for? Well, I think I th what really gives the low rates to the very rich like me is the is the low tax on dividends and capital gains. If you take these rich people that the IRS singles out from 1992, they've almost had a tenfold increase in capital gains. They've had a tenfold increase almost in, in dividends. And those, those are taxed at 15%. And there's no payroll tax on it. Now, the payroll tax, 
accounts for almost as much revenue to the government as the income tax. It's, uh, it's close. Uh, $800 billion plus on payroll taxes last year and about $900 billion on, on income taxes. That's where the money comes from in Washington. And they don't get any payroll tax to speak of on my income. I, you know, I've got my tax return here. We're going to take <laughs> and, a look at them in a moment. Yeah, <laughs> and and they, you know, they get, I get taxed on up to $100,000. And, and, uh, and my super rich friends get taxed up to $100,000. And that tax hits the people in my office very, very hard. Often they have a spouse working, so they get taxed on up to $200,000, that payroll tax. And that's at, this year we've had a waiver of two points, but that's mm -hmm. normally at 15.3%. That alone is higher than the tax rate on capital gains or dividends. Uh, you point out that the average tax rate for people in your audience, in, in your, the average rate for people in your office is 36% of taxable income. 36% and nobody's below 33%. And incidentally, the lowest income person in the office is higher than the 33. They, they don't have the low rate. So from 33 to 41, they range, and they average 36. And I'm in there with a fat 17.4, I think it is. And, and why is that? Well, it taxes. If you make money with money, you get taxed very, at very low rates, 15% dividends mm -hmm. and capital gains, no payroll tax. If you make money with muscle or hard work or sweat of your brow, you get taxed at rates that move on up. And most of the people, the middle class, gets taxed at rates of either 15 or 25 on their income tax, but then they get really hit hard on the payroll tax, and that's what brings the rates in our office up to an average of 36% if you leave me out. What has happened to the tax rates for the lowest 20%? The poor don't pay any. I right. mean, there, there's, there's 80 plus million actual taxpayers uh, that, that, that pay tax. Incidentally, some of the extremely wealthy don't pay, but that's just, that, that's an aberration. But no, the, 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 tax, the taxes are falling, the high rates are falling on the middle class and, and the upper middle class. Mm -hmm. The argument is sometimes made by people who believe that it is always good economic policy to reduce taxes, that if in fact you reduce taxes, uh, you will create uh, economic expansion and economic growth. People will go out and create jobs if they're not paying as much tax. People, if they're paying a higher tax, will not make as many investments. Well, I worked with investors for 60 years, small ones, large ones, super large ones. Yeah. I have yet, and, and I've worked with capital gains rates of 39.9% and 36% and 25%. I have yet to hear one person say to me, if I call you in the middle of the night, Charlie, and I say, Charlie, I've got this hot investment idea. Your reaction is not to say, no matter what the tax rate, forget it, I'm going back to sleep because uh, the capital gains rates are too high. No, what you're going to do is you're going to say, tell me the name quick, Warren, before I <laughs> change your mind. You know? and, uh, I have never had one person decline to invest with me. And, yeah. and I was running money 40, 50 years ago when rates were much higher. And I never had one person that showed the slightest reluctance to uh, take an investment idea and run with it. What are the other reasons um, that, for, that is essential to do now? Well, I, I think it is essential. I, I, th I think people are very, very upset about how their government works, and particularly how it worked during this uh, uh, raising the deficit ceiling uh, period. I mean, uh, uh, so as I talk to people, they're very disillusioned. Howard, Howard Schultz of Starbucks came right. up with an article just the other day on that. So I think, I think it's important that whatever is done restores to a degree, and can't do it overnight, but restores to a degree people's faith in the fact that their government can work. Now, I also think fairness is important, and I think getting rid of promises that you can't keep is important. I don't think we should cut spending dramatically now. I don't think that what I'm talking about on taxes solves the, the uh, uh, deficit gap at all, but I think fairness is important. I think having a sensible long-term plan is important to explain, and I think having it be believable is terribly mm -hmm. important, because people don't believe these out-year things generally with Congress. They've seen too much it, of what's happened. Is part of this, um, being in the position that you're in, you want to start a conversation about the reality of taxes sure. and the reality of balance and fairness? Yeah, I think, it's, I think the American people deserve to be educated on what fellows like me are paying in taxes, for example. But they have to be educated on the reality of future promises. They have to be educated on the necess necessity of running significant deficits when the economy is weak. I mean, there's a lot of things in, in terms of economic education. But, but this is the time to do it. If we don't do it now, if these 12 members 
who have been appointed now to the super committee, yeah. if they come back with something that's a lot of mush, you know, the American public's at it. <laughs> and and what happens to the country? It isn't good. It mm -hmm. isn't good. The country will still come through. Believe right. me, we can. We will. We'll rise to whatever occasion the, the occasion demands eventually, but. We are wasting so much in the way of potential output in terms of the opportunities for people that we ought to get on with it. I mean, the, the job of government is to govern. Mm -hmm. Let me go to the debt ceiling debate and just talk about it for a moment. It's just like, let, let's just say, Charlie, that you and I agreed that after we left uh, the studio here, uh, we were going to go out to a track near here, and I was going to get at one end with my car, and you're going to get at the other end, and there's this line down the middle, and whichever one flinches loses his net worth to the other guy. You, do you want to play? Yeah. <laughs> Whether you want to play depends on how crazy you yeah, think right. I am. Yeah. So what do we do if we go out there? Your network's on the line, my network's on the line, the engines are revved up, you know. And I make all these menacing gestures at you. I try to look like a dog. You a make dog me think you're crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you're trying to make me think I'm, uh, you're crazy. And we both get in our cars and we don't think the other guy's crazy. Yeah. So what do we do? Yeah. Right as the engines start, I throw out my steering wheel. Now you believe me, right? <laughs> well, Boehner didn't throw out the steering wheel, McConnell didn't throw out the steering wheel, but a group behind them said, throw out the steering wheel, Mr. Speaker, and make those people realize that we're not going to agree to anything that, you know, un unless we get our way. And, and if you have a sane person dealing with somebody that you feel may be insane, by the point that when they throw out the steering wheel, you feel they're insane, you lose. And the American people lost, incidentally. Uh, then along came Standard and Poor's uh, and basically downgraded. Yeah. Because they said uh, it appears that the U.S. Congress is dysfunctional and unable to deal with the issue. Yeah. You disagree with the downgrading. 100%. I mean, but you they, understand why they made the oh, decision. Oh, I understand why they did it. But I will bet you McGraw-Hill owns Standard and Poor's. Right. I'll bet you if they have any short-term money around, it's in treasuries. <laughs> I, I don't know that for sure. But, uh, they would not be worried about it, that being yeah. in treasuries. Uh, and the, that's, in fact, what happened. Treasuries. Treasuries are strong. Right. We can print money. Yeah, you know, there's 17 countries in Europe that gave up the right to print money, and believe me, they know what it means to give up the right to print money. Because they joined the eurozone. Yeah, they joined the eurozone, and now they, they they've got terrible problems because they can't print money. We we can print money, so we don't we don't have to worry so much about our government becoming dysfunctional as we have to worry about that damn printing press becoming dysfunctional. For so, some reason. In, in fact, you are saying that the United States can always pay its bills, and therefore, it should not have had. It's AAA rating downgraded. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. But what, what do you make of the Chinese criticism? Well, I, they, I'm sure they're enjoying it in a way. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, uh, well, I would criticize too, because if I were the Chinese sitting with a trillion plus of U.S. government obligations one way or another, I would be very worried about what's going to happen to the purchasing power of that. I mean, I've got the right to get the trillion dollars back, and I will get the trillion dollars back. The question is what, it'll, what will it uh, buy at that time? And our government gives you the impression uh, at times that if they will resort to a printing press, they'll resort to a printing press if necessary. And if they do enough of that, uh, the value of the dollar goes down, and it goes down significantly. So if you hold a lot of dollars, which the Chinese do, I can see getting very unhappy about that. What do you think of the Federal Reserve's announcement they're going to keep interest rates low? Well, that's a very, very stark statement. I mean, the, the, the Fed is saying when they say we're going to keep it rates low until 2013, that they say <laughs> they're really saying the economy's not going to be very good until then. Uh, that's a, that, it's an unusual statement. Which you disagree with? I, I, I think there's a chance they're wrong, yeah. I think, that, I think it may pick up before then. You think the U.S economy will pick up. Yeah, the U.S. Then. economy is, I think it, well, it's been picking up ever since the summer of 2009, right up to last month. I mean, I, 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 I see figures on 70 plus businesses. What is unusual about this is we had a huge recession caused in large part by a housing bubble. I mean, you had, you have 67 percent of the people in the United States own their own homes roughly. Right. And those people who had a $22 trillion asset at the peak saw its value shrink dramatically. That, that's affecting two-thirds of the households in the United States. That had that incredible impact on the economy, and we won't come back big time uh, until we've worked off the excess inventory that was created during our binge on housing uh, a few years back. We are, we are making progress on that every day, every week, every month. I mean, we are producing less houses than we are households. Except 
household formation has to increase beyond, beyond the place housing construction. Housing construction, no, no, housing, and, that, and that's been happening for a couple of years, and it's exactly what should happen. Uh, now, I actually read some article the other day about people talking about blowing up a few houses or something. If you blew up a, a, a million houses, you'd probably be in balance now. <laughs> I'm not advocating that. But, and if you started having households being formed by 12-year-olds, you, 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 you could speed up household formation. But we're not going to have that either. But we are going to have households being formed. That's baked into the demographic pie. You are saying that the, what's wrong with the American economic growth picture right now is housing and construction right. and, and... Every one of our businesses, virtually of our 70-some businesses, are doing better quarter by quarter by quarter, except those tied to housing. But housing, and things like housing that. is way bigger than construction workers. I, unemployment will fall significantly, in my view, when we get back up to a million. Housing starts it. Because it won't just be construction workers. It will be our carpet workers, where we've laid off 6,000 people. It will be our brick workers, and it, go up and down the line. So uh, the big recovery, we've recovered on corporate profits. We've recovered in terms of of getting the banks back in shape. Banks are in good shape now. We've recovered in all kinds of areas. Corporate America is doing fine in most areas. It's not doing fine in things tied to residential construction. That won't come back until we work off the excess inventory. But the inventory is not as, the, the, the amount of excess inventory is not as high as a lot of people think in my judgment. And that's why I say it could be before two, mid-2013. Mid uh, Going I, down to 8% or something? I think it go, I think if construct, when, when Home construction is a million units or more running at that rate. I think we'll be at 7% or below. You have a, bit, a bet with Peter Orzog, the former director of the Office of Management and Budget? Yeah, but I'm talking settlement with him. <laughs> 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 what was the bet? The bet, the bet was on by election time that it would be down to 7.3%. And I thought, I thought housing <laughs> construction would come back by that point. Yeah. And I may be wrong. I may be right. But, yeah. I, uh, but when I will guarantee you, when housing construction gets back to a million units, and it can go beyond that. I right, mean, it right, could easily right, be a right. million, too. Uh, we will have, unemployment will fall dramatically. To 6% at some point? Yeah, certainly below 7. Below, well, close yeah, to 6. Yeah. Then. By, 20, by 2013. Oh, I, 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 think, I think it's likely to happen. The Federal Reserve <laughs> disagrees with me, yeah. and Bernanke's a lot smarter guy about that than I am. But, but I, we are working it off. I mean, we have, we have never had this low level relative to population right. for as long as I know the figures on. I mean, this, this is a huge correction of a bubble that popped. And, and what is necessary to take place between, over the next two years in order to increase household formation and decrease the amount of construction? Well, we're doing pretty well on the decrease of construction. Right. Uh, we've, we have, we've not done... Demand is a factor in that. Demand's a factor. And we artificially gave it a little uh, boost when we went with the, uh, the, the credit, you know, year to go on, 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 on purchase of homes. I think it's a mistake to try and, uh, try and front end it. I mean, it, it just delays the eventual recovery. You, if you've got an excess of something, if I've got too many purple dresses and I run a dress yeah. shop, I get rid of those purple dresses, and, and then I can start all over again with the dresses that you know, the people want. Yeah. And I, I mark them down to whatever it takes. You, know, you could... You could you could have you could have a bunch of rich immigrants come in and they'd all need houses, for example. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to change your immigration policy so that you let 500,000 families in, but they had to have a significant net worth and everything, it 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 solve things very quickly. You know? But naturally, it's being solved. Capitalism is solving this. What we're fortunate in is Japan has a declining population. I mean, if they get an excess of something, it isn't going to get worked off. We have households being formed every day. I've got a grandson getting married <laughs> this weekend. Uh, so we're, for, we're forming them all the time. And, and we're forming them a lot faster than we're building homes. And we have an economy that's based on domestic demand? Sure. Yeah. Whereas China was trying to shift around from an export demand to a, yeah, to yeah. a domestic demand. Yeah, they'll be a strong exporter for a long time. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you look at economic growth, first there's a job question, but then there's also the rate of economic growth, the increase in GDP. How do you see that? I think it'll be. I think it'll be very good over time. I mean, I, I, we have, we have the same things that have been working for us for 200 plus years. We've, you know, we've, we, we, Charlie. I was born on August 30th, 1930. That was the high day of the Dow Industrials in that year. It was at 242. They'd come back. People right. thought that they didn't think that we were going into a recession. What happened in the next couple of years? You know, at 4,000 banks closed. The Dow went to 41. That's like the present Dow going to 2,000. You know, my dad lost his job. We had the dust bowl here and everything. We're living six times better than then now. Uh, the American system works. It works terrifically. And, and uh, 
it has it has occasional uh, recessions. I mean, we've had probably had 15 of them since the country was formed, and this was a particularly bad one because we had a bubble in the biggest asset around for the American public. You have made the point that I guess it was in 1779 or somewhere right about then. Uh, that the Chinese population was like 290 million. Yeah, 290 million. I the think American population was about 4, 4 million, million, and Europe's was about 50 million. Yeah. And look what happened. Look what happened. And we weren't smarter. We didn't work harder. We didn't have greater natural resources. We just had a system that worked, and they've been smart enough to catch on. <laughs> yeah, but, but there are interesting things that are at work as well. The demographics are at work. So they have more domestic demand possibilities in China because of their population, or in India because of their population, or in Brazil and places like that. Some will argue that it's going to be a much more competitive environment for the United States. While we may have a system, other people are learning from our system, and they also have some built-in advantages that we don't have. Yeah, they've, got, they've gotten smarter about things. I mean, yeah. they, if you go back 50 years in China, the Chinese were just as smart then. They worked just as hard, but they weren't getting results. And now they're, they're getting incredible results. They, they, they picked up on the system, but that's not bad for us. I mean, we do not, the world isn't a zero sum game at all. We want the rest of the world to prosper. We'll sell them a lot of things, you know. Most people don't realize it, but our exports as a percentage of GDP have doubled in the last 40 years. You know, we have become better at exporting things, but just we like to import a lot better. Two big debates coming up in terms of, of this country and a political season. One is about taxes, uh, which you are speaking to in this piece, basically saying the rich ought to pay more. The other is the role of government. Um, a deba how do you see that debate? Well, I think, I think if we get back on more or less the formula we had, which was getting 18 and a half or 19 percent of our revenues from taxes, we can spend 21 percent then. We can run a deficit of a couple percent of GDP on average over time because our, our country will grow and we have a lot more debt paying capacity than we had back in 1790. Just like I've got more debt paying capacity than I had 50 years ago. So as your income grows, your population grows, your wealth grows, you can handle more debt but you can't let it keep increasing as a percentage of your income or wealth, and which is what we've been doing like, you know, like crazy lately. So I don't mind a couple percentage point gap, 18 and a half or 19 on revenues, 21 or thereabouts on expenditure. But that means we have to hit both sides and we can't put ourselves on a trajectory that takes the expenditure side up automatically as the years pass, which is what we've done with entitlements. Do we need another stimulus program? Well, we've got, a, we have the, we've got the biggest stimulus program the world's seen virtually going on right now. It's very, that debate has really gotten somewhat ridiculous in my view because stimulus, fiscal stimulus is when the government spends a lot more than it's taking right. in. So the deficit is our stimulus. The deficit is our stimulus. You can, you can say a bridge someplace is part of that act. You can say cutting taxes is part of it, as was the case in the, our stimulus act. But the stimulus is the government pouring more money out than it's taking in. And we have a, a stimulus going on that's 10% of GDP, which we haven't seen since World War II. Uh, so we have a huge stimulus going on. Nobody wants to call it a stimulus because that's got to be a dirty word, but we have a big stimulus. We do, in my view, whether we have a 10% of GDP uh, deficit, right. which is a huge stimulus, or a 12 or an 8 doesn't make much difference. I, I think that we've pushed monetary policy to the limit, we've pushed fiscal policy to the limit, but fortunately, the most important thing in terms of this country ever coming out of recessions has been the natural workings of capitalism, and I think you've seen that the last couple and, of years. And you are saying at this table this day, you do not see the likelihood of a double-dip recession because the only thing that needs to happen to make this the economy as strong as it is is new construction. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say, I would say there's, only, there's only two things that could cause me to be wrong on that in my view, and, and, and I, th I don't think the, either one. is people lose so much faith in government to handle things that they that they just they they talk themselves into a huge funk in this country and the second thing could be if somehow the troubles of Europe spilled over here. Confidence is an important thing. Sure it is. And there was a damage to confidence based on what happened in Washington. Charlie, I own stock in a lot of companies. If I get upset about the management, you know, what they're doing, do I lose confidence? Yes. Do I feel different about investing with them? Yes. I mean, I mean, you you want to have you've got to have confidence in your leaders. I mean, we went into World War II with confidence in our leaders. I, you know, I mean, that it's vital. It looked like we were losing the war for six months, but we never lost confidence in our in our leaders. And it's we you have to believe in them, and they have to give you reason to believe in them. Help me understand now what the danger is 
that we face, if things don't happen as well, if Washington cannot get back on track, maintain the confidence of, of the American people, and at the same time make the right decisions. Because if that super committee doesn't do the right thing, that's why I'm telling them to do the right, right. thing. Uh, with but, Bernanke, but that's why you tell them, the, you, this is directed this is, in part to that super committee absolutely. to say, look, no, you've got to look at taxes if, really strongly. Here. If I can pick 12 readers for it, <laughs> they're the ones. No, if you go back to S September of 2008, I mean, you had a, a month when everything was falling apart, Freddie, Fannie, hey, right. you, you name it. What our leaders were saying to us then, the, the key players, they were saying, we'll do whatever it takes. And I believe I knew they had the power to uh, do whatever it took, and then the, I believed they would do it. Now, the problem about government now is that if they come out and get on the Sunday talk shows and say, I'll do whatever it takes, you know, people don't believe them. You know, I mean, they, 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 they've got to see action. And, and here they see something like the uh, raising the deficit limit used as a hostage uh, for something so vital important to the United States. I mean, if you can use it as a hostage, in terms of spending, you can use it a hostage on, on funding education or anything else. I mean, it isn't limited to that. If, if you've got something that comes up like that, people do not want to see the instruments of government used as weapons. Uh, that, you know, the, the idea of the old idea of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the law, that it's a shield, not a sword. I mean, we, it, 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 the minorities become a sword in, in this respect. And I don't blame this on Speaker Boehner. I, I, think, I, I think if he'd... You talked about the members of the Tea Party and, and the, the people that said the people the when he went back to him said Republican. said to him you know you're not going to have our support <laughs> if, if you go in there and bend an inch on this. Uh, they said throw away the steering wheel. You have also said that you guarantee that there was one way to get people to vote differently <laughs> on this, which yeah. is if in fact if you say unless you reduce the deficit to three percent of GDP, three percent of GDP, and it's now about ten percent. Right. Unless you reduce it, then you are not eligible for re-election. Yeah. If you had that facing them, you'd get a decision about these issues right away. Tomorrow. But that's, it's still tongue in cheek though, Charlie, because if you, during a huge recession like we had, during an all out wartime period, you don't want them operating with 3% of, uh, you know, I mean, you need larger deficits, but you certainly need something a little less than that on average over time. But I, I just use it to illustrate that this is a world of incentives. Right. And we work on incentives in every way. We work on them in education, in business, every other place. And when I try to think of the incentives to get somebody who comes up for re-election in a year to do something where the policy cycle goes out five years or ten years, you know, how do you do it when the when the policy cycle exceeds the electoral cycle? You got to you got to make sure the electoral cycle's in the equation. Uh, what else do you want these? 12 members of Congress who are sitting on the super committee to think about beyond taxes and a balanced approach, which is also what was recommended by Bull Simpson, also recommended by the Gang of Six. It's incredible. I mean, here you had Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles. You couldn't have two finer people, intelligent, good humored, on opposite sides of the aisle. They get together and they get Tom Coburn and Dick Durbin. To sign on to something. I mean, they worked a Democrat for, and Republican, a liberal Democrat from Illinois, absolutely. a conservative Republican but, from Oklahoma. Yeah, they were putting their country ahead of you know their yeah. personal feelings, and they worked for months and months and months. And they get criticized, and they, I'm sure the hours they spent arguing over given things that they had to compromise on. And they get 11 out of 18 to agree, and that just gets tossed aside. I think that was a terrible mistake. Simpson Bowl should gain, gain momentum. You know, I mean, when you get people who work like crazy, you know, many months, personal reputations right, at stake right. and everything else. And you get Coburn and Durbin, <laughs> that's, I mean, I give credit to both of them, I, equal credit. I think, I, I, you know, I may not agree with Tom Coburn, but I think, uh, you know, I think he's On a real statesman. Yeah. I, I think he's a statesman. And he was, and in fact, he was prepared to take reductions in, in absolutely, absolutely, in, 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 in corporate uh, income tax. There is also this, um, the president's leadership. You have said on most social issues and on distribution of wealth, the president are in sync. Yes? Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, I just mean that in terms of a woman's right to choose and in, in, terms, of, in terms of not having uh, the rich get by with lower taxes than the people in their office, and there are a bunch of things that I agree with. There's limits to how much you can do in that. But, and, and but what about distribution of wealth? I, I, I think that in, a peri in the last 25 years, the Forbes 400, which is different than the IRS 400, right. Forbes 400 have gone from a couple hundred billion of wealth to a trillion two or something like that. I mean, uh, you've had the income of the top Americans quintuple top 400 in the last 20 years. This is becoming a nation of 
of haves and have nots and super haves. Not the, I don't, listen, anybody makes $250,000, I don't consider them rich, particularly if they live in New York or LA or someplace like that. Uh, so uh, That's why you put the level at a million dollars oh, first yeah, and then yeah, 10 no, million dollars a second. Yeah, no, listen, but, you want everybody to be able to get ahead in this country and you want them to be able to enjoy the fruits of what they do. You like being rich? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've been poor, I've been rich, and rich is better. <laughs> but the idea is that... Uh, oh, no, no, it, it, it should be a land of opportunity. And, and people that get rich, they, uh, nobody's going to confiscate everything or anything of the sort. But the distribution in this country, a uh, market system has led to extremes. A guy that's wired like me, I don't have any special status in this world. I'm, I'm you know, a great nurse, a great teacher, may be much more valuable to society than I am. I'm wired so that I can figure out what things are worth. Sort of. capital. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I get super rich, you know, and, and somebody who's adenoids are in a certain, you know, <laughs> arrangement gets, gets rich, but television makes a lot of people rich. I mean, you know, Lou Gehrig held out for 25,000 bucks in the late 30s, you know, they benched him. <laughs> they didn't bench him because he had to break the street, but he had a long, right, right. Had a long struggle. Television has made the, the 230 hitter, or the 240 hitter, you know, uh, better than Ted Williams at 406. So it, there's a lot of serendipity. This. We, everybody in this country owes their good fortune in some way to the rest of the country. This is your 2010 tax return. That's my 2010 tax return. What will I see there? Well, you'll see, you'll see a lot of income. <laughs> you'll see total, let's see, adjusted gross income of about 62 million. And, right. But then I, I gave, you're only entitled to deduct 30% of your contribution. I gave right. a lot. So, I, I've got a tax, I've got a charitable carry forward of about $10 billion. I don't think I'm going to use it up. But then you get to taxable income, and I've got $39.8 million, and then you get down to tax, and I've got $6.9 million. And, uh, and that comes to what percent of taxable income? I think it comes to 17.4%. I added and in other my, people in your office are paying an average between of 36%. 30, 36, 33 to 41. Nobody's below 33. Hmm. Nobody's below 33. I think that they're, how much they're, they're going to have to do with, How much of that has to do with the payroll tax? Well, a lot because yeah. they all pay it. I pay it, incidentally, yeah. but it's fifteen thousand dollars for me, you know, fifteen thousand three hundred dollars, and it's fifteen thousand three hundred dollars for all the people in the office, pretty much, uh, and many of them have spouses where it's another fifteen thousand three hundred for the spouse. So with some of them, it's thirty thousand dollars, and and that's a lot of money to them, a lot. And you said you want the twelve most important people can read this are the people in Congress who are on the CEPA committee. What else can be done to give it leg? Well, I hope the Times is a launching. Bad. I think that it's a subject worth serious discussion, and 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 uh, I, I already heard from somebody this morning that they're putting on Facebook. I never thought of social media as being the way to. to they're putting this column on Facebook so get a wider and, and a yeah. different distribution. Yeah. Yeah. The six hundred million. I think, I think if the public is educated on what goes on, I think their representatives will follow through the, to some extent. Uh, I, I, I think some members of Congress don't even understand that, probably. You know, I, I invite them to take their own tax return you know, and make the same calculation I did. And incidentally, I don't have a tax shelter. You know, I don't have, I've never had a tax shelter. I don't drill for oil. I don't do any of that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, the Congress has been my tax advisor. I mean, they're taking care of me. You also make the point that in so many corporations that uh, their biggest investment is not in uh, plants and equipment, it's in lobbyists in Washington. Uh, so therefore they get deductions so that their effective tax rate is also much less whatever the maximum corporate tax rate is. Yeah, well, that, that, that's true. And, and, and they're entitled, incidentally, to try and, I mean, there, there is a big rule book up there. Yeah. And if the rule book's got flaws in it, the thing to do is to change the rule book, not count on everybody being on the honor system. I mean, yeah. I mean the, the rule book is what counts. And I'm probably creating a lot of, uh, uh, a business for the lobbyists now because they'll be very busy defending the present situation. But I think I think it's the rule book that has to be be looked at. Do we need tax reform? Yeah, I think I, I think so. But I think I would I would cure what I wrote about in the New York Times this morning first. That's very easy to, to do. do. Those two yeah. things, and that doesn't solve everything, Charlie. I mean, and it would have, go ahead. It probably it tops. Would be fifty billion dollars a year. Now everybody talks in terms of ten years now, so it'd be five hundred billion over ten yeah. years. But this doesn't close the gap. I want to move up toward that eighteen and a half or nineteen, and I hope we get a lot of it out of growth. But I think it's it's kind of silly at this point to count entirely on that. And I think we've got to move the expenditures down to twenty one or thereabouts percent. How do you measure President Obama's leadership on this? Because he could have done more to be in support of Simpson Bowles. 
Yeah, I and wish he, he could have been out earlier. I wish he'd been. I wish he had. I, uh, both sides were afraid to touch Simpson Bowles. I mean, that's pretty clear. I mean, uh, it uh, it made too much sense. <laughs> they didn't want to be associated with it. I would say this, though, in terms of the deficit uh, limit uh, negotiations, when the other guy throws the steering wheel out the window, you've got a problem. <laughs> I mean, if you and I get in those cars and I see you throw the steering wheel out the I, I give up. You win. <laughs> yeah, in fact, if, when you looked at the Republican debate the other night, and they asked him to raise his oh. hand if you were in favor, you know, of a level of spending cuts which were ten for one. Ten for one. Ten for one. I and mean, everybody would not go for that. That if was, it was, ten that was to pathetic. One. That was pathetic. I mean, listen, I, I like Republicans. I mean, if you if you got Democrats on some core issue to them, they'd probably yeah. do something just as silly. But that, when they take that attitude, they are really saying, you know. I want to win this primary. <laughs> they are mm -hmm. saying that the country be damned. I want to win this primary. And it means that, that a certain element of, of a philosophy on taxation has taken control of the public debate within that party. It has, particularly in terms of the primary, because the, the primaries push people to extremes. Uh, you know, that's one of the problems we have in this country. But they can't believe in their hearts, all 10 of them, that a 10 for 1 ratio would in some way irreparably harm. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you said you're prepared to, to uh, make, as I raised earlier in this conversation, specific spending cuts and entitlements, changing Social Security, uh, trying to reduce the cost of health care, which is essential. Charlie, on my tax return here, you had George Will on a few days uh, ago, right. and George said he couldn't understand why he was getting Social Security. Here it is. Social Security benefits, thirty-two thousand six hundred. You get thirty-two thousand. Thirty-two six eighty. Right. And 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 you even don't a, need por it. a portion of it's tax-free, not a very big portion in my case. But so you make it means test. Oh, in a second. I mean, it's. It, I think it's. I think the idea when we've got. We've got this very very rich family in this country, a lot of us have troubles. Sixty million people live in households, where the income is twenty-one thousand dollars a year or less. And I say to people who say, you know, that we shouldn't raise taxes, just try that for a few weeks. I mean, <laughs> just try it. Uh, so I think that when we're going to have to do things that are even a little bit tough on them, maybe, I think you've got you've to come after some of us. And you certainly shouldn't be giving me Social Security. It's deposited in my bank account every month without me even knowing about it. <laughs> Where does this populist instinct in you come from? I was born lucky, you know. I was born in the United States of America. The odds were at least 30 to 1 against that. I didn't have anything to do with that. I was born wired for capital education. I didn't right. have anything to do with that. So here I am. I won the ovarian lottery the day I was born, you know. A lot of people don't, you know. They go off to Afghanistan and fight for us to preserve things for me. I mean, I, I, when some of my friends complain about their taxes, I feel like saying, let's continue this conversation on the shores of Normandy. You know, let's just mm -hmm. go over there and we'll just talk about this, <laughs> how, how terrible your situation is. And I, I really think this country works wonderfully on a market system. And we don't want to give it up. It needs, we have to control that market system in many ways. But it works. It works with the kind of incentives we have. It works with equality of opportunity. It's not perfect, but it, we, we've, tried, we, we've tried for it over the time. But the lucky ones still prosper incredibly disproportionately, you know, under this. I'm not for having some kind of a czar in Washington that decides what's proper for everybody, but I do think something that thinks about the 60 million people that are living at 21,000 a year or less in their household. I think, I think a rich, rich, rich society should th think about them a little bit every day. That's the America you believe in. Yeah, it, it is. That I think it's the America mo most people believe in. Mm -hmm. Are you okay by Dodd-Frank that, in fact, that was the appropriate reform to I do? Read, I haven't read it, Charlie. I think that to the, there's two things that are needed to keep the financial system from going crazy. You know, one is keeping some limits on leverage, and we didn't do a very good job of that last time. And incidentally, well, Dodd-Frank's devoted to that a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, but uh, Congress, you know, I mean, they encourage huge leverage in Fannie and Freddie. I mean, that's where the money was. Uh, the second thing is having the proper incentives for people at the top of important financial institutions. You know, we saw institution after institution go to the government and say, we're too important to this society that you can't let us fail. Uh, so pour in the money, do whatever is necessary, and meanwhile, I'm going to go off and be rich. You know, right. <laughs> they got to screw it up. Uh, I think you've got to have downside, I mean, really drastic downside. Uh, for the people that run financial institutions, big ones, they get into trouble. And, and 
we need those incentives, and I don't think they've attacked that yet. That can be done through the board of directors. But too big to fail continues to exist. Too big to fail will always exist. There will always be institutions that are too big to fail. Should they're they be they're deciding but, but, over in Europe that Greece is too big. Okay, to fail. but should they be broken up? I know that. Yeah. It's, should, should those institutions no, yeah, be broken no, up? No, no. As one federal form of federal no, reserve. Yeah. We we decided yeah. the whole banking system's too big to fail when we put in the FDIC. In effect, right, I mean, right. there we can't exist without them. Uh, so, but we have to do something to change the behavior of people that are at the top of those institutions. So they have huge downside. They didn't have downside. You know, people. I'm not going to name names, but they. They, th those people did not have downside. They had downside to their reputation, but they walked away with tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. So you can't have that kind of a situation exist and expect great behavior. And then you have to have some restrictions on leverage. But has that changed? I, I, the, the incentives have not changed very much. They, they say they've changed by paying them more in stock and all that, but that isn't, that isn't draconian enough for me. All right. I want to come back to Omaha. As, as great. We, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. but, and, and, and look at just what the lessons of Berkshire Hathaway are. For you, I mean, most of your businesses uh, are growing. Yeah, railroads growing. Everything's growing. Everything's almost, growing. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, you are finding that you need to hire new people. Sure, we're, we're, we're investing a record seven billion dollars this year in in capital investment, almost all of which is in the United States. That's at least a billion more than we've ever invested in the past. There's plenty of things to do here. You have often said that I mean, in a time like this, in which uh, there are difficult times. That's the best time for you because you can have more opportunities to buy things that you think are of quality at better prices. There's no question about that. I like buying on sale. But, uh, last Monday we spent more money in the stock market buying than any day this year. You know, but it was buying stock. Buying stocks, yeah, yeah. not business. But, but buying business is very infrequent. I mean, the, 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 there's a lot of happenstance in that. But you got to be ready to do it. Uh, there's much discussion in the paper about buying another acquisition of Transatlantic, I think it is. Yeah, we, insurance we, company. we made an offer about a week yeah. ago. That offer's expired now. But, but wh <laughs> so <laughs> that's... <laughs> yeah, we don't leave things out. <laughs> and you don't like bidding wars either. No, no. Yeah. All right. no. But if you look at Berkshire today, it's different in the sense that more of it is owning businesses 100% yeah. than it is owning stock. And we've been going that direction for 20 years, but, it, but people are seeing more and more evidence of it. But we're... We employ 260,000 people or more, and, and we have added to employment this year. And, and With the exception of homes and construction. Yeah, uh, we're getting And killer. carpet and all those businesses. Yeah, everything associated with it. Second largest real estate agent and all that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the one thing. So, so Berkshire, in a sense, offers an opportunity to look at where the economic, econ U.S. economic growth is. I can, tell you how many had, I can tell you how many people had dilly bars yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Everything from dilly bars to, to, to corporate aircraft. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Zellick, the president of the World Bank, said, uh, this is a very, very internationally is a difficult time. And because what's happening in the United States and in Europe uh, could very well uh, be, a, be a, a warning sign. Do you? You seem to say, look, my success of my companies is different, except for construction the United, and houses. The United States has been improving. I mean, it went through, we talked about it, it was economic Pearl Harbor. Right. I mean, I use right. that term. And, and, and we had a shock to our system that was really colossal. I mean, and, and a, a few people hadn't acted right, with it, even more so. But we have been coming back steadily. Uh, the mood has gone up and down more like this as we've gone. But everything I see in businesses, we've been coming back steadily since the summer of 2009, and, and that continuing you know, right up through last month. Now, can something happen that will interrupt that, perhaps? But I, but I, haven't, I haven't seen it. Europe is a different story. Okay, that, but put Europe in the context yeah. of this, though. I mean, how could the sovereign debt crisis in Europe affect the rest of us? Well, the problem is I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen over there. I know 17 countries that joined the European Monetary Union gave up the right to print their own money. That was a huge, huge decision. I hope the United States never does it. I mean, it, it, it changes the to game. They controlled your own finances, in fact. Yeah, and, and they, they linked themselves. They gave each other their credit cards and said, you know, let's all go out. <laughs> and, and some behave better than others, uh, or worse than others. Should they and dismantle the Eurozone? I then? don't know how. You, I mean, it's, it's very complicated. I mean, you've got to decide one of two things. <laughs> you've either got to decide that these members are actually going to get their act together, the ones that are, have troubles, uh, in a very major way because they need lots of money. I mean, they have to refund their old obligations mm -hmm. all the time. So 
Nobody has to lend money to country A, B, or C. They, I mean, in the end, nobody has to lend money to them. The United States, if nobody lends money to the United States, we print it. But not over there. I mean, if Greece owed their money in drachma, they'd have a lot of inflation and you know, devalue and all of that, but they wouldn't have a problem paying their bonds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they gave up that right. Now, either the, the weaker countries get their act together in some major way, and I think that's very, very difficult, or basically the very strong companies, and we're talking countries, we're talking Germany, have to say, I'm willing to take care of my, my brother-in-law that's been using us my credit card. Yeah. Well, that's keep what you. they've said so far. Well, it's, they've sort of half said it. I right. mean, that's, the, that's their problem. I mean, you know, if you're having a runner to bank and you've got 10 people in front of it, no FDIC insurance, mm -hmm. you know, that line's not going to stay at 10. You're either going to get rid of those 10 or you're going to have 100. Right? And so far in Europe, they've sort of kept talking to the 10, you know, and a few more straggled up. And so they didn't get rid of the line. And when there's a run, the, the line only gets longer unless it gets taken care of very quickly. But, but what are the consequences for the United States and for, for I, Asia? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think they're necessarily extremely dire. There have got to be consequences, but I yeah. don't, I don't, I, 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 Europe won't go away. I mean, we're selling a lot of goods in Europe. And mm. our comp it's company, a huge market. Oh, you know, it's a huge market. And they're not going to go away, and the, the, the plants aren't going to go away, and the farmland isn't going to go away. It just can be kind of an economic mess for a while. You have said before, uh, that to me and to others, that Berkshire is your canvas that you paint on. Uh, it's your masterpiece. Well, I don't know about masterpiece, but it's my <laughs> canvas. <laughs> so what, what is it that, if you look at it today, Berkshire, uh, you find fault with? Find fault with? Yeah. Well, I, I, I made plenty of mistakes along the way, right. so I've got a lot of brush strokes yeah. out there that if I just give me a little whatever it takes to remove that, I, I would do it. So I, I made plenty of mistakes, but I expect to make mistakes, and I'll keep making mistakes. So because unless you take chances, you won't make mistakes. Oh, sure, and, and, and mistakes are part of the game. I mean, you're swinging at pitches, and you, you miss yeah. a few. But no, I, 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 I don't want to sound too <laughs> I feel good about Berkshire. I mean, it, yeah. I, the people I'm associated with, the businesses, the we have a... A per, we lay out our economic principles, and I laid them out many, many years ago, and we, we don't change them. I mean, we, 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 we try to operate that way. It doesn't mean we're perfection. You've got a company of 260,000 people. I'll guarantee you right now somebody's doing something I wish they weren't. I mean, you can't have a city of 260,000 people and have no jails. But, but overall, I feel there's a, a culture that I don't think any other large really large public company has, and I think it's enduring because it's so in, inculcated in the, the managers, the shareholders, the directors, everybody. So I, I, I feel good about Berkshire. W would I be wrong to suggest the thing you worry most about is whether after you are gone that that culture remains as it is, that you have in a sense made Berkshire strong enough to exist without you? Yeah, I don't worry about that. I worried about it over the years, which is why I did a bunch of things that I yeah. think uh, ensure that future. But I. Uh, there, that's always the question. I mean, you, you know, you've seen all kinds of great companies topple for you, one reason. You once said to me and to others, uh, you have to make your company idiot-proof because at some point some idiot will run it. Yeah, well, that may be even the case now. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> but, but if someone has said, I think, that the thing you worry most about is whether Berkshire will be intact 20 years after your oh, I Well, I don't worry about it, but I care about it. Yeah, no, I, and since I care about it, I, I've put things in place which I think almost ensure that, that Berkshire will be a lot better 20 years after I'm gone than, than it is now. Where, where is succession today? Where is succession? Yeah. If I die tonight, tomorrow morning, it won't take the board an hour to have announced Who the my new success. CEO is. Yeah, absolutely. They know exactly who it is and they agree. And but it may change six months from now. It's unlikely to change six months from now, but it could. I mean, yeah. you know, that person could die. Uh, is there a list of people or one person? No, there's several people, but there's there's one person they've all agreed Takes over on. Takes over CEO. Yeah, 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 and, and there should be. I mean, there's there's no reason to have the board of directors start thinking about who the CEO should be uh, the day after the uh, present CEO leaves. I mean, they've they've neglected mm -hmm. their job if they do that. Was was the Sokol affair the thing that that caused you most angst because it had to do with judgment of? Well, it was it, it caused angst. Yeah, I don't know whether it's the most in my uh, uh, yeah. business life, but but it's it was it's, it was up there. Yeah. <laughs> when you think about whatever legacy there is, your legacy is Berkshire Hathaway beyond family and philanthropy. Yeah. Well, it, it, 
I'll settle for those. <laughs> <laughs> you quoted Christopher Wren, Sir yeah. Christopher Wren, who I think created St. Paul's Cathedral. That's right. He's buried there, too. And, and, and if you go there, the epitaph he has uh, written for yeah. himself is... I, it, I'll paraphrase it maybe a little, but if, if you seek my monument, look about you. And I say that's, should be the, that, that's, that's the way we should think about this country. I mean, this country is a monument to what was done a few hundred years ago and, and the people that have followed. I mean, it's incredible. Just think if you, back in 1790, you say, I want to create a monument to this, this new country I'm giving you. And you'd envisioned the country of 2011. I don't think anybody would have dreamt big enough. You know, I mean, this, this is one, it, this is something to, and so I just, you know, when I'm, when I fly across the country or when I'm, I just, that thought occurs to me that if you, if you really seek this country's monument, if you seek our founding father's monument, just look around you. And you worry today uh, that there's some threat to that. Not because the system is not right, not because the system is not uh, strong enough, but you worry that there are things happening uh, that will uh, make it less great if well, they are not addressed. I think we're being tested, Charlie, yes. But I, we were tested in the Civil War. We were tested, you know, in the Depression. We were tested, you know, December 7th of 41. We were tested on September 11th of 2009. We, we, we will get tests, and this is one of them. We'll surmount them, but I, <laughs> I would just as soon get on with the job of surmounting them now. Mm -hmm.